do that, then you can upload it later. All right, we are recording. We're live. Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Seldovia Art Council's first of a three-part series of photo essays. Before we get on with tonight, I'd like to let you know that our next series will take place Friday, March 26th, with our presenter, Jonathan McLeod, who is our newest um, Art Council board member. Uh, the photos he will share come from his approximately two years he spent conducting research in Indonesia. Jonathan will share reflections of how the Abun people seek to define the good life in a remote rainforest area and the push and pull of social changes that come with development and being core connected to the outside world. Jonathan says he draws some parallels with his own with his own recent experiences of moving to rural Alaska town of Seldovia. So we look forward to that. That'll be next month. And the April last Friday will be our own Cindy Mom, who has worked as a naturalist and a guide in various places in Alaska. Cindy's presentation will show you a, a colorful sample of wildflowers and birds found in Seldovia and beyond. It's my pleasure to welcome tonight Erin and Belisa sharing with us the inner title life of Seldovia and the inspiration it brings to both the scientists and the artists alike. Again, everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. And now a big welcome to our presenters, Erin and Belisa. All right, you got it. Thanks, Vivian. I am going to share my screen, you guys. So bear with me for just a minute. He didn't do Thanks. Oh, there you go. All right, so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so most of you know me and, and my work, but I thought I would take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Felisa Higman. I'm a cut paper artist and I grew up in Soldovia. I left for college, moved around a bit, and then moved back to Soldovia in 2012. As an artist, I'm often asked where do I find my inspiration? This is a hard question to answer because I find inspiration the same way I find happiness, a million little ways. Often the spark of inspiration is that flash of happiness or a moment of humor, a feeling of compassion. For this presentation, I'm going to focus on finding inspiration in the intertidal zone. When I visit the intertidal zone, I'm not necessarily chasing my muse. I'm there for a feeling of excitement when I lift the rock to peer underneath. The thrill of discovery as I push aside a curtain of kelp and find some new creature hiding there. It's a treasure hunt with a time limit and a reset button. You can visit the same place again and again, only to find it changed and new. My parents moved to Soldovia in part because of my dad's fascination with the tide. He kept his tide book, the book, handy at all times. He knew how high it had to be to bring the skiff up the slough or into 4th of July Creek. He'd call Walton Sachiko when the tide was especially high and ask, is it up to the baby's arm? Referring to a baby doll arm that he nailed under the boardwalk to indicate a certain tide. Though my dad loved the flood of the high tides, it was my mom who really introduced my brother and I to the joys of the low tide. Early memories include popping badarkies off rocks with a butter knife and digging clams below our house. We had a friendly octopus that we would visit bringing tasty morsels to try to coax it out from under its rock. I remember one nighttime low tide with my mom and seeing my first scallop, perfect and pink in the dim glow of my flashlight. Moving back to Soldovia as an adult, I got to rediscover all those childhood memories, often with my brother's kids and sometimes with friends' kids. And as I shared with them and learned with them, my interest in the inner title grew. As an artist, my first love is color. When the tide retreats, I can feast my eye on a whole new palette. This is especially important in winter 
when the lowest tides are at night. And the world above is monochrome. I feel nourished by the red of the blood star, the pink of the coralline algae, and the green of the moon glow anemone. Not only does this intertidal zone fill my life with color, it is also a riot of patterns and texture. I often joke that my spirit animal is the lined chitin with its seemingly endless color combinations and bold stripes. It and its relatives, the tiger chitin and the blue line chitin are often the showiest creature in the tide pool. But the rest are not to be outdone. The bryozoans with their perfect little scales and the sponges with their points and craters. The overlapping plates of an armored sea cucumber. They all seem so orderly and precise, like medicine for an overcomplicated life. Even the kelp, plain and simple, is laid down by the receding water in swirls and cascades that are pleasing to the eye. By its very nature, cut paper artwork is form driven. The composition is comprised of black outlines, so it's the edges of things that get the most attention. The inner title is full of interesting forms with dramatic outlines. Nudibranchs in bold colors contrasting with dark kelp fronds. A red hermit crab scuttling across a pink tide pool. An octopus arm reaching out from a dark crevice. Some creatures are so bizarre, they're almost unbelievable. A sailfin sculpin with its ridiculously large dorsal fin. The graceful sea butterfly with its transluc translucent wings. The sea mouse with its fiber optic hairs and retractable feet. The real draw for me when I'm low tiding is learning the habits and relationships between the different creatures I'm observing. The checkered hairy snails are almost always found beside a tube worm because they're scavenging scraps from them. I recently realized that almost every keyhole limpet has a passenger under its pointy shell. A scale worm hugs the limpet's soft body and is protected by the same shell. In return for the safe haven, the scale worm helps defend the limpet from attacking sea stars. It's easy to find relationships, both benign and antagonistic. The boring clam leaves a perfect pocket of seawater for a stranded sculpin or pygmy cancer crab. A moon snail bores a hole through a hard shell to attack its prey. These little stories are great material for my artwork. When you enter the inner tidal zone, you're becoming part of its story. As your shadow passes over a tide pool, the hermit crabs scramble over each other and the jingle shells and scallops snap shut. As you flip over a rock, a black claw, a black claw crest leg crab brandishes its claws in your direction and a crescent gunnel rise with a frenzy of movement before disappearing under another rock. A tube worm hermit will boldly defend its home. Or you might have to wait patiently for a hermit to reemerge after you startle it. On a recent nighttime low tide, I realized that tube worms didn't withdraw as I knelt over their tide pools. By eliminating my shadow with my headlamp, I was able to overcome their shyness and observe them more closely. You learn the habits of the various critters and get better at finding them. You recognize the octopus midden. 
and you know to look under flat stones in the spring for male lump suckers guarding their eggs. As I learn more about the animals and plants of the intertidal zone, a sense of attachment and admiration develops. And it's this bond that really brings me back over and over again to the rocks at Outside Beach, the cliffs at Schooner Beach, and the sandy isthmus to the Tombolo Island at Inside Beach. It is also this attract, uh, attachment that inspires me to bring the inner title into my artwork. I also like to think that uh, my mind has absorbed some of the colors and the textures of the low tide and that those pop up in my work as a whole. And that's it. I just have to figure out how to <laughs> find my cursor again. All right, I'm gonna switch over to Aaron now. Hey, so now you're going to get a slightly different set of pictures here. Let me share the screen again. And Oops. So, there is me and Felisa and Katmai and Latuya out low tiding one day this last summer. You can actually see uh, Valisa's artwork in this picture has on our leggings. Uh, so I actually am wearing them today. I have tide pool leggings. And I've actually loved intertidal critters before I ever moved here, back when I first took a marine biology class in 10th grade down in Seattle. But we really live in one of the best places to look for them. We have such a big tidal range and such a diversity of different beaches and rocky and sandy and cobbly. And so you can really find more animals there than you can really anywhere else. So we try to get out for all of the really big tides, usually all the ones that are minus four. And half the year that means we're out there at night with mittens and headlamps and half the year we're out there during the day when the kelp are growing all over the rocks and making it really slippery. And the thing that I, I think I like the most is just how much is there. I, you know, you think of all the mammals that live around here and it's really only a handful and you think of all the birds and it's definitely quite a few more but you go out on a good low tide and we could see a hundred animals, different species, and you go out on a few, maybe 200. And so I thought, I don't know where to start then. I can't show you all of them. And so I thought I'd just start with kind of the base of the food chain. I mean, the base of the food chain really is all that algae and the kelp, all of that stuff that's growing in the sun and then next up is all the things that eat it. There are so many animals just sort of crawling around on the rocks eating algae. These are little puppet marguerite snails and they've got their bodies all twisted up because that's how they're fleeing quickly. I can't remember if they were fleeing from me in this picture. And then you have the little tiny lacuna snails that look like they're just pebbles all over the kelp. And they lay those little donut hole eggs that you can see even if you can't find the snails themselves. And the rib top snails have these really pretty rings. And then all of the limpets all over the rocks you have, even in pretty high intertidal zones, they're crawling around. You don't even see them move, but they're eating algae too. The one on the left is uh, kind of a fun one because it's called an 
unstable limpet. And usually they actually live on seaweed and they've got this funny kind of rocking shape to cup the, uh, the curve of the kelp. That one's on a rock though. And Valisa's favorite, you have the chitons. Uh, everybody's familiar with, well, people around here anyway, are usually familiar with the black one that people call the darky, but there are so many different species of them and you just start looking and they're kind of decorating the rocks all over the place. These are all the line chitin relatives. Then you have all the ones that have hairs. And then you have really big ones like the gumboot chitons and those white ones on the side or just the size of your fingernail. And I really wish I knew why we have, you know, at least 15 different chitons crawling around on the rocks doing mostly the same thing, eating algae. But I think it's fascinating that we do. And some of them you find only underneath rocks and some of them you find on top and some of them you find on different beaches. And then you have sea urchins that are also crawling all over the rocks grazing on algae. And sea urchins are a really interesting one because they are really a key part of the ecosystem and in a way they can make everything go really badly. Uh, it's been seen in a lot of places that when you get too few sea otters, then the sea otters stop eating the urchins and the urchins eat all of the kelp and then there isn't any kelp left for other species to shelter in, which isn't a problem here. We have plenty of sea otters, but they've seen that in various other parts of the Pacific coast. And of course, you can eat algae by crawling around and scraping it off the rocks, but the filter feeders like the barnacles and the mussels and all the different clams and scallops and oysters are also another really at the base of the food chain. And by the time I get here, I've shown you, you know, so many different creatures and I realized I can't possibly just go through all the ecological niches. And so I was going to instead take a little time to talk about some of those stories of interactions. You saw earlier that Felisa showed you some tube worms. Here are a few of the kinds of tube worms. The one in the upper right is called a slime tube worm. And I always think that's really fascinating because it has the little, you know, feathery parts that stick out and they catch little things in the water and they suck them in to feed but the tube that it's using to protect itself is entirely made out of gooey slime. And so somehow it manages to secrete this gooey slime in the water and have it stay kind of coherent and worm-shaped. And then the ones uh, in the lower right are just one single little curl. They're teeny tiny, smaller than your pinky fingernail. And if you look closely, they make these little tiny red tufts and little pink curls and they are all over every rock. Like if you go into the intertidal zone, you'll see thousands and thousands of those. And then these filter feeders, they're pretty common. They're kind of at the, you know, near the bottom of the food chain. And so there's so many other species that interact with them. I think Felisa mentioned these, these checkered hairy snails. There's one, it's hanging out by a closed tube worm and it's going to steal the food when that tube worm comes out to feed. And then you have the tube worm hermit crabs. Hermit crabs all use the shells of usually snails that are lying around on the beach, but these ones have evolved to only use tube worm shells. Instead of having a curved body to fit in a snail shell, they have a straight body to fit in a tube worm. And the females, you can see one in the bottom right, they crawl into empty dead tube worm shells that are still stuck to the rocks, but then they're stuck there. And so the male tube worm hermits have to find broken off dead pieces of, of tube worm and they get in those and then they can crawl around 
and meet up with the females. And sometimes the pieces they find are just these huge, awkward pieces that are still even stuck to rocks. You almost wonder how they could possibly move with them, but somehow they manage. And so then all the hermit crabs have their own preferences. You can see the, the one in the top middle there shows the regular kind of the curled body that they usually have to fit in a snail shell. When you start looking around, you see like on the left, there's these, there are hairy ones that tend to use tiny little shells that they can't fit very far into and they scuttle around really quickly if you notice them. Then in the lower right, you have others that use really big, heavy shells they can barely move and they just suck themselves in to hide. And then the upper right, you have wide hand hermits that have a claw that's designed to be big and wide that it can fit over the door of the shell they live in to close themselves in. And so they're all kind of, they all have their own strategies and they all use different kinds of shells. And I know Valisa was saying the, the chitons are, are her spirit animal. I think I might have to choose hermit crabs for mine. They're, I just, they're very common, but I love the way that they have their like cute little buggy eyes and that they scuttle around all through the tide pools and under the rocks and, and fight over the shells that they live in. And not just shells, they also have interactions with other creatures. So this is a hermit crab and it's in a snail shell and a sponge is growing over the top of the snail shell. And this is called a wandering sponge. And as the sponge grows, it gets bigger and bigger and it eventually dissolves the whole shell. And now you just have a hermit crab that lives in a sponge, but the sponge, it's a filter feeder. It's an animal that just gets food from the water. So it gets a benefit from being on the hermit crab because now the hermit crab's scuttling all over the place and it has access to more areas of water than if it was sitting on a single rock. And the hermit crab now, instead of this hard shell, has this nice soft sponge that actually is going to conform to its body and kind of grows as it grows. So this hermit crab now is never going to have to leave that home. Unless that home becomes food. So here you can see, it's a little hard to tell, but the big orange thing is one of those wandering sponges. The hermit crab opening is on the bottom side. On the left side is a giant bite taken out of the sponge. And on the right side, that yellow thing, that yellow thing is a nudibranch. Uh, a Monterey Dorid, and it likes to eat sponges. So it's eating the sponge that's the hermit crab's home right now. And sponges aren't the only thing that can grow on the outside there. This is another hermit crab. And if you look at all those little feathery, fluffy, blobby orange things on its shell, those are actually hydroids. They're relatives of anemones. And so they sting. They don't sting, you know, a, a person. They're much too tiny, but they would sting something trying to eat the hermit crab. And so this hermit crab has kind of gotten itself a little set of defenders that it just carries around on the outside of its shell. And and the and the little the little anemones, the hydroids, they get to the same thing the sponge does they get more access to food they can grab out of the water. Now, I don't know what happens. I don't think they actually consume the whole shell in this case. So probably when this hermit crab grows, a different hermit crab is going to get to take advantage of all these hydroids. And, you know, the hydroids are related to anemones. Anemones are, are one of the most fun kind of colorful things to look for in the tide pools. And they're actually surprisingly long lived. I mean, you think little things like this, maybe they live one year, two years. Some of the big, you know, green and red Christmas anemones, they can live to be over 
80 years old. So if you go down to the beach, you can visit the same anemone over and over again. There's actually one really particularly big one on Schooner Beach that we do that with sometimes. And most anemones, they just have a life cycle that basically involves being stuck to rocks, using their tentacles, stinging things, grabbing them, and swallowing them into their mouths. Except for this one. This one is called a jelly-dwelling anemone. And actually, when it's a larvae, instead of just sort of floating in the water and then landing on a rock, it ends up floating in the water and in finding a jellyfish. And then it goes into the jellyfish and it starts eating the jellyfish from the inside out. It's like parasitic on this jellyfish. And finally, when it's pretty much consumed the whole thing, then it goes and lands on the bottom in a sandy area and grows up into a very normal looking anemone until it spawns and sends its babies out to uh, eat jellyfish from the inside out again. This anemone is interesting. It's one of the things that, you know, there's so many things in the intertidal zone and you think that somebody must know what they all are, but that's not always true. This is a pink and a, or an orange anemone. Mostly they're pink. It's pretty common around here. I uh, was looking in all of the books trying to find what its name was and I couldn't. And I looked online and I couldn't and I asked people and I couldn't and finally ended up mailing an anemone to an anemone expert in Russia. And he told me the genus name, but I wasn't sure what the species was. And the only possibility was either that it was new or that it was something that they'd only found once way down in Vancouver Island. And since then, somebody found one in Kodiak too. And so we think, okay, this is one that they discovered within the last 10 years on Vancouver Island down in, you know, Southern British Columbia. And nobody knew, knew about it before, but it's all over here. So I just think it's interesting that there's things that people don't really know about still. Anemones those, have those stinging cells in their tentacles tend to protect them. And they protect them from most things, but there's always exceptions. So this is a, a nudibranch. Nudibranchs are basically snails without shells and usually prettier. And this one likes to eat anemones. And not only does it eat anemones, it can take the things that make anemones sting. And in, when it, instead of digesting them, it can push them intact out to all its little sort of hair as you see here and now it can sting when something tries to attack it. And so one of the neat things about exploring the intertidal is looking for where things live, what are their habitats, and, and this little clam is interesting because it's called a boring clam and it actually makes itself holes, but it can only make itself holes in soft rock, like limestone. So if you go to White Rock Beach, or if you go to the rocks at the, the jetty that were made from White Rock Beach, that's limestone, and these clams are everywhere. They can make their little holes, and you just see their little red mouths stick out. And then the little yellow spots near them are boring sponges that do the same thing. But any other rock, you won't see them. And there's some things that live in the intertidal zone, but don't really like the water all that much. There's a couple species, this one's called a leather limpet, that live in the intertidal zone, but they breathe air. So this has to hang out high in the intertidal zone. And most creatures, when the tide goes out, they're just kind of waiting for it to come back. This one has to wait for it to go out again in order to breathe. So it's basically holding its breath underwater at high tide. And there are things that you can find everywhere. I just put these three crabs in here because they're the most common little crabs that you find when you're turning over rocks in the intertidal zone. The pygmy cancer crab, the hairy crab, and the kelp crab. And they're mostly scavengers too, although the kelp crab also eats kelp.
And there's other crabs that are more common than you'd think they are because instead of hanging out under rocks, they just, they're everywhere on the beach. They're just really well camouflaged. So the top two are butterfly crabs and they can be all kinds of colors, but all their claws and legs are hidden under that butterfly-like shell. So that can just look like a rock or a bit of coralline algae until you turn them over. And then the one in the bottom right is a decorator crab that I took a picture of it upside down because I've tried to take about a million pictures of these right side up and they look like clumps of kelp. In fact, you almost don't even notice them. The best way to see them is you get there right as the tide is going out and you see all these balls of kelp running to try to, uh, to, try to get into the tide as it retreats. Now, crabs, you know, they seem much more personable, relatable, but some of our closest relatives other than fish that you'll see on the beach are these blobby looking things called tunicates. They're actually, they're also, they're not, they don't have vertebrae, but they're chordates. So they're in the same phylum, the same big group as people. And when these things are larvae, when they're little babies, they like have kind of a primitive spinal cord, they swim around, and then they give up on that strategy entirely, stick themselves to rocks, and have like a pair of siphons that take water in and push water out, and they filter feed and kind of act more or less like sponges. And they grow, some of them are like, kind of solitary, some of them just sort of form big colony-like mats. And in some places there's tunicates that are invasive that come on ships. A few years back, we found this tunicate that was all over the place and it looked a little bit like one of the invasive ones. And so we started taking pictures and samples of it and, and uh, getting it to the people at the research reserve. And luckily it wasn't, it's just a native tunicate. But that was one summer, it was everywhere. And now you still see it, but it's not so common. I don't know what conditions made it just explode that one time. Octopus, one of the most fun things to find. You know, when we go out, Felisa mentioned that it, it kind of is like a treasure hunt. And there's you know, I'm enough of a geek for intertidal creatures that I'm perfectly excited finding a new species of worm, but there's some things that are always exciting to pretty much everybody and, and octopus are one of them. Like the, the big picture there is a little teeny tiny baby octopus in a clamshell and then you have a sort of smallish one and just the, just the suckers of a big one visible in the other pictures. And some things didn't used to be special, but they've become special. So this is a, a sunflower sea star. And they used to be really common all over the place, especially in Jackalope Bay. They're big, they're fast, they crawl around with lots of fuzzy arms. But a few years ago, um, back in, I think, 2016, there was a big sea star wasting epidemic that had gone all up and down the west coast and finally got into Catchmack Bay and killed off nearly all the sea stars. This is a sea, some sea star arms that kind of melted off and all the sea stars, not all, but most of them melted into piles of goo and then they were just gone. There were years that there were hardly any. And then, so it's been fun to kind of in the past four years to sort of watch them come back. There are a few species that weren't really affected, like on the left, there's a leather star and the blood stars were pretty okay. And then the little teeny six red stars, there were just so many of them that they started coming back more quickly. And then in recent years, we've started to get more and more of the other ones, these big sun stars. And even finally, this in the past year, we've been starting to see lots of the sunflower stars again. And these are actually, they aren't coming back everywhere. They're endangered in a number of places. So it's nice to see that they're coming back here. 
And then along with those, we got this brand new sea star that we'd never seen before, which is related to the one that has six arms, but it has five arms. And so we call it <clears throat> a five raid, six raid star, which sounds kind of funny. And then occasionally we find one that's missing an arm. And so then you end up with a four-legged, five-legged, six-legged star, which is just kind of ridiculous, but they don't have another name as far as I know. And, you know, as I was putting this together, there's just, there's so many things and kind of the more you look, the more things you find. So earlier I showed you some of the more common crabs. Here's some of the weirder ones. There's rhinoceros crabs and heart crabs that have the little red hearts on their backs and scale crabs and flat top crabs. And some of these things we've only seen once or twice, but it's always exciting when you find them. And this is kind of just a little picture of us at the end of that one day when we were tide pooling. And I, I've got sitting there, I've got a little write in the rain notebook in my lap and I'm making a list. So, you know, I say we can sometimes see like a hundred different creatures. And the reason I know that is because we actually do write them down. And it's been sort of a long process of years of learning all these different species and keeping lists of what we see. So, which I think is, especially after the sea star wasting has made me realize that you never know what's gonna happen, what's gonna change in the ecosystem. And I think it's, it's both interesting and important to, to kind of have a record of what was there. And I just wanted to end by showing you this thing called iNaturalist, which is both a website and a phone app. And it's another way of, of kind of recording observations of anything alive, right? This doesn't have to be, this can be flowers, this can be birds, this can be squirrels, but a lot of what I put on it is intertidal creatures. So all those little pinpoints or different observations I've made, and you, you can upload your photos either from your phone or or on the computer. And the fun thing about it is that both it has the data, but there's also lots of people there who will also see what you've found and they can help you figure out what it is, which is a lot of how I've learned these things. So this is just one from earlier this year was this funny little fish with a sucker on it that was like, you know, the size of a fingertip. And so I took a picture of it and I couldn't figure out what it was. It didn't look like any of the fish that we knew. And so I uploaded it onto iNaturalist with a guess. And then, you know, an expert came in and, and had an idea and showed me a link. And now I know this is actually a baby of one of those smooth lump sucker fish that you, that Valisa showed a larger one of earlier. And so that's just been really fun to kind of share those observations and, and get the get help from other people. So if anybody ever does post anything on iNaturalist, I can maybe see it and help you identify it. And that is all I have. And so I'm going to stop sharing here. And then Felisa and I both are here for anybody to have questions. So if you have a question, remember to unmute your computer. Anybody out there? <laughs> They're all <laughs> muted. <laughs> yeah, but that was awesome. That was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Aaron. Thank you so much. It's just amazing, and uh, the way you both approached it and took in so much of the ecology and the art. Um, I've been taking a few notes on bamboozled. <laughs> yes, wonderful presentation.
presentation. I want everybody to know that this will be recorded and we will have it on YouTube. So as I was going through that with you all, I thought, oh my gosh, what did they just say? So I'm just happy to think I can go back and watch it again and see these beautiful pictures and kind of put it together. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, all right. Maybe we should wrap up then. Vivian, do you want to say anything else from sure. the Arts Council? Sure, sure. Thank you. And, and to you ladies, thank you very much. And I'm sure when we hang up, I'm sure people will say, what was it they said? And I could, I didn't get my question in. But again, everybody, make sure that you find it on YouTube. And maybe, um, Jonathan, you could maybe put it in the chat, our YouTube. Um, unless, Tanya, unless you know our um, YouTube engine that we're using or where we're posting it, maybe just put in YouTube, type in. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, immediately well, though, because we're just recording it onto this computer at this moment. So we'll have right. it'll take we'll time. definitely post it on the chatterbox and also the Instagram page. So it'll be excellent. Up. Yep. And, and excellent. I think I'll also put that iNaturalist link. So anybody who goes out there, if you see some intertidal creature and you're curious about it and you don't have anybody to ask, take a picture of it and put it on that app and I'll see it. So <laughs> I'll help you. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah, somebody that's a wonderful if I can't. Yeah. That is a wonderful app. And again, unless somebody else has um, more to say or would like to comment, I was just gonna remind everybody that this was the first of our three-part series that the Art Council was doing. And I wanna thank Valisa and Aaron for being our first and it went smoothly. I applaud you a lot. And, and next month, remember the last Friday of the month, we'll have Jonathan and then April, the last Friday of April, we'll have Simi Mom. But I wanna thank everyone who participated tonight and. Um, Excellent. I'm, I'm just so happy we did this. Great job. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Vivian. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Felisa. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. All right. I'm going to yeah. shut okay. up. I'm going to leave. Okay. <laughs> All right.